<laughs> now we are. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Welcome, everybody. We love to see you here. And uh, let us know your name and well, your name is there and let us know where you're uh, joining us from. Yes, Lisa's we have already said people already. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for welcoming everybody. Hi, Robert, Terry, Amy, Marie from Norway, Peggy, Sandy Socks, uh, Patricia, Susan Henry. So thank you guys for joining us. We're very excited that you're here. And today's the topic uh, for episode nine is going to be all about uh, the advantages uh, of working with a limited palette and you know what does that actually mean um, for me personally. Um, this is something I probably did after painting for a good uh, at least decade, if not two decades. <laughs> uh, how about you, Lisa? Like when when did you start working with a limited palette? Oh, well, you know, that was actually something that my watercolor instructor taught me from the beginning, actually. So, um, but it was a whole different animal with realism, you know, than it is with abstractions. So yeah. I learned a lot when I transitioned. <laughs> yeah. So I think that the thing about working with the limited palette is it's, it's great for if you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced artist, because there are advantages. And uh, some of the advantages, I think, are that you have a lot of freedom as soon as you start working with um, a limited palette, which could, you know, first let me define what that means. It means like one color plus black and white, or two colors plus black and white, or three colors plus black and white, or it could be even 10 colors plus black and white, right? But it's it's a parameter, it's a limitation that you give yourself because once you've closed that door, like you say, okay, these are the colors I'm going to use. It doesn't mean that at the end you might not bring in a surprise color. You yeah. Know, for a little dip. But yeah, so uh, basically it'll give you freedom because you'll always have this cohesion and harmony. And I'm gonna do a demonstration pretty soon here. There are a couple things uh, like how do you choose what limited palette you want to work on and really um i wanted to show you some things that um that i've done here over time and there are a couple different ways to determine like how do you choose your limited palette that has to be a question that most artists would have and so um let me just do this real quick and having black and white in acrylic or you know other mediums makes such a difference too sure so, um, for example, this is a, a more like, you know, not every, no, this is not about the grid, but what this is about is exploring a one color palette. So amazingly, this is one color plus black and white. And I'm going to show you some examples of just one color plus black and white. And I hope what you see is that one color plus black and white is actually not as limiting as you might think. It's so mm -hmm. these have all labeled. So like this one is transparent earth yellow plus black and white. This one is, uh, I made my own indigo. My own indigo is ultramarine blue plus Payne's gray. And that's a monochromatic. Here's quinacridone violet plus black and white. And you can see there's no, no real reason to get bored just because you even have just one color. This one's permanent green light plus black and white. Now these are also done. Some are acrylic, some are oil cold wax medium. It, the medium doesn't matter. So what I want everyone to really uh, know is that it, it's never dependent on the medium. And like alizarin crimson is transparent across all mediums, unless you're going to like maybe create pause or something like that. But as far as the, the fluid mediums or oils, acrylic, gouache, et cetera. And you can also do it in encaustic. So this is one color. It's um, Indian yellow plus black and white. This is encaustic that I did a swatch and then Ooh, that's exciting I don't think I've seen one of those in encaustic yeah right yeah. and I did one, like just so you know this is done on multimedia artboard and I did fuse it you know just lightly but you can certainly do a, a palette or a swatch like this with any medium and here's cad red medium and I've got this is my yellow now now we're getting into two colors so these have all been one color that I've shown you but I want to show you how quickly things get very, very, like your world of color gets bigger and bigger. So when you add a second color, this is just two colors now. This is yellow ochre plus indigo blue plus black and white. I don't count black and white because they're kind of always there to get tints, tones, and shades. And sure, you 
make your own black if you don't want to use black the color. You can make your own dark, that's fine, but you'll get the similar result. This one is Cad Yellow Light plus Ultramarine Blue. So again, no reason to get bored. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you. Now we get into three colors. Um, I'm going to show you. This one's Cad Red Deep, Haynes Gray, and Transparent Earth Yellow. Uh, to me, this is like the epitome of like, you know, do you really need any more than three colors? Uh, when mm -hmm. I when I first did my three color swatches like this, I realized that, you know, I don't think I'll really ever need more than this many colors because that's a lot, right? And then here's another three color palette. This one's a little bit more muted. It's transparent orange, iron oxide, paints gray, and asphaltum. Again, plus black and white. Now, these are from paintings that I've actually done. So um, not only did I do the swatch, but then I went and I did a painting. So swatches are just meant to be like, hey, this is what you get. You know, it's good to test out those colors before you commit to a painting. It this is. one was when I did my fluorescence, um, three colors, the fluorescent red, fluorescent blue, and fluorescent yellow. And um, finally, a four color palette this is the two complementary, so green, uh, permanent green, light, phthalo blue, cad red medium, and alizarin orange. Um, here again, you can see how how very quickly things, I mean, this is over the top, four colors. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> of course, Lisa loves that. She loves color. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you love color, you know, then, um, you know, again, you can have up to 10 colors on your palette. There's no limitation. The point is that you... Uh, think about the colors that you want and then you go for it. So, and then I want to show you how that, like ha looking at a swatch is, is, is good. It's a start, but it doesn't really tell you what a painting is going to look like. So let me just show you, um, these are examples from my powerful design personal color course. And there is a free masterclass for anybody who wants to watch um, basically how I think about these limited palettes and why they're important and how it helps you to really expand your art. So this one, I'm just going to hold this one up. This yeah. is, yeah. I just wanted to mention that um, while we we're talking about the color swatches, Bonnie says she loves these color swatches and looks forward to creating her own collection. And we are going to be doing that. And Bonnie has been doing that. She's in powerful design, personal color. And I, she's been posting her palettes and I look at them and it's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to get in my studio and make color swatches because she makes it look so beautiful. So thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> That's a great comment. Yeah, we, we love seeing your work in Powerful Design Personal Color. And Kimberly wants to know, she would like to know how you set up your swatches. And so that's something she can learn in PDPC or Pro as well, if she's interested in that. Sure. Yeah. And I, I do some demos here. I'll be showing you like mm -hmm. a couple, you know, different ways. Actually, what I'm going to do is show you a way to do it without the grid because the Great. grid is basically the colors plus black, white, and gray. Um, so this is black and white showing you what a black and white. Now, can you see the cohesion? Number one, when you keep the palette the same throughout a series, you get cohesion. So that's, that's one of the first advantages. When you say to yourself, okay, I'm just gonna use black and white, you're not worried about adding red. You're not worried about adding green. You're not worried about, think, you're not thinking about adding blue. You've decided at the start, I'm gonna work with black and white and I'm going to exploit that. So when you exploit whatever it is you've decided on, you're going to the extremes of the blackest black, the whitest white, and all the grays in between, you can focus on that and then you can focus on shape, you can focus on mark, you can focus on texture because color is not going to be confusing to you. That's a huge advantage for any beginning artist. Um, it's a huge statement if you're intermediate to advanced. So if you, if you, if after all this time, let's say you've been an advanced artist, you've been painting for decades and you're like, you know, I now know what I want. I love black and white right? Some people may love black and white. They may want to do a whole series that's just black and white, or maybe they've explored a monochromatic palette. That would be one color plus black and white. So no reason to be bored, but every reason to find those few colors that you really respond to. Like, let's say that it happens to be the cool colors, or maybe it's a warm color, but this type of thing and doing a lot of it will help you really find that personal voice um, because you're going to respond. You're going to be emotional. Like you might be like, oh my gosh, I, I love 
how this magenta color is making me feel. Um, this one would be two colors now. So this is one color plus black and white. This is two colors plus black and white. Again, cohesion mm -hmm. is just a given. You, it's so a given. pretty. Thank you, Lisa. I did these ages ago. I did these back in 2018, but I saved them because this is what I, you watch over my shoulder in powerful design, personal color, and I create all of these 16 paintings. So it's all about working in a series with the limited palette. And then this one is three colors. So you can see how the, the whole complexity of your painting, yeah, it gets a little bit more, but there's cohesion. And then this is just a random one I did with another limited palette. So again, when you limit your colors, you can focus on the things you really, other things you really care about, like what about shape? What about big shapes? You know, what about tiny mark making, right? So you can, uh, it's a question of limiting your variables so that you can focus in on something and really dive down deeply to figure out what you want to do. So I just want to show you that that's how a swatch relates to the painting. So now let me go to my table. Any questions or comments, Lisa, about that? Um, well, uh, Marie asked about the free masterclass. So I was going to get that link put up there because you're talking about this wonderful thing, stuff that, you know, you teach in that. And um, so I want to be sure that people can right. get to that, right? There, there's a free masterclass, you guys. It, it basically talks about my three stages that I use that I that I've shared with uh students in powerful design, personal color, as well as art success masters that really um, shows you basically how I figured out how to trick my left brain into like leaving me alone so I could really focus on being creative. And I found that when I shared this with other artists, it's just three ways, three different mindsets, three different ways of thinking as you create your painting from beginning to end that artists that I worked with could relate to it. They could start playfully they could move forward with a little bit of thought and then they could they could actually finish their paintings by clarifying so i have a free master class lisa can provide that link in the chat if she can do that yeah, and i think i can okay what i'm going to do now is show you my um my desktop here so let's just um add this to the Get screen that. yeah make it the solo layout. So here guys, I'm working in oil and cold wax medium, but like I showed you with the swatches, I want to point out that it does not matter what medium you work in. Okay. Um, in fact, the more mediums you work in, and I know a lot of you out there do, that's actually a good thing. Um, if you want, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some of your work in acrylic may look a little different from your work in oil and cold wax medium, but don't worry because it's all you. Now, how do you know what colors to limit yourself to? That's gotta be a question that you have, right? Like, cause do I start with one color, two colors, three colors? Well, I'm gonna demonstrate right now um, a palette that I've actually never used together. I don't know what will result here, but I will tell you what the colors are. Here's my black, here's my white, here's my yellow ochre. I made my own indigo with ultramarine blue plus Payne's gray. And I've got quinacridone red. Now I've never used these colors together as a painting. Uh, and I chose these kind of randomly, sort of, but um, obviously it's kind of like a primary palette or three colors. It's got the yellow, the blue, and the red. But obviously it's not the, you know, the real close to the primaries. Now I have a little bit of cold wax medium next to each color because, uh-oh, what if I forget to mix it in? And I don't really want to do that. I don't want to forget. So what I do is as soon as I put the little color out, I put a little dab of the cold wax medium and it is mixed with the Galka gel in a one to three proportion. If you have any questions about that, go back to the very first episode one and I show you exactly how I mix that. Here's my black. Again, I, I'm just, even with my little swatch here, um, it's good to just add that cold wax medium. It will dry faster. And here is my indigo, lovely color, because I mixed it myself. You, you can go a little bit bluer or a little bit darker. And I do tend to have um, a lot of palette knives going at one time, just because for this demo, I don't have to clean every time I switch colors. But if um, I wasn't doing a demo, I wouldn't have to be having so many palette knives. So don't think you need this many. Now what I'm gonna do, I've mixed those colors, right? Now, 
you don't have to go full blown onto a, a fancy canvas or panel or whatever. You can start to play uh, with these colors and see how they interact. Now I showed you the grid. That's one way to do a swatch, right? And a swatch is simply all the possible color combinations you can get from whatever limited palette you've chosen. Now here is, I'm gonna put down some yellow ochre here like this. Um, I'm gonna just sort of play. I'm not gonna worry about it being a grid. Then I'm gonna take some of this beautiful indigo and I can see how dark it is, right? So this is an example of what I might do to decide whether I even wanna use these three colors together on a more expensive panel. This is a sheet of Arches oil paper. And I'm saying to myself, okay, well, I've never combined these colors before. Let's see what happens. Now I'm adding a little bit of white to each color. And let's see with the red. Now, now I know what red and white does. That's a tint. And I've got my blue over here. Let's add a little bit of that. So even though this is not, it's not a grid, I'm still exploring my colors. Can you guys see how you can very quickly see at least what white does when you combine oh, yeah. it? Yeah, so that, that in itself is a great thing to know. Now that I've done that, well, what happens if I combine, say, these two guys together? So I might scrape a bit of that together and mix them over here. Because look, it's the cross between these two that makes sense that I put it over here so I can kind of keep in my mind what I'm doing. Wow, what a gorgeous color. I never would have known these two colors. Oh, that. <laughs> that's beautiful. I know, I love that. I've not known, I've not used quinacridone red, you guys, ever. So this is oh. all. <laughs> I've used the other quinacridones like magenta and uh, let's see, quinacridone, nickel azo gold. Look at this. What a oh. gorgeous purple. I never would have known. Um, beautiful That's color cool. there. Now, what about the blue and the yellow ochre and the indigo? So let me grab some Ooh. of that. Yeah, let's see what happens. Okay. That's a Great. lovely desaturated bluish, greenish gray, blue, green, gray. Right? So already I'm like, whoa, I love this palette. I didn't do a grid. Lisa doesn't like grids. <laughs> I'm doing this in part to show her that, hey, you don't have to do a grid. Uh, <laughs> now, I haven't even like begun to, you know, really exploit these colors because what about black? You know, we haven't talked about shades, but I can mm -hmm. add a little dab of this to any one of these colors and show you what happens. It's pretty cool. So I've shown you tints, which is plus white. I've shown you the plain color, and now I'm going to go into a shade. And that just means it's going darker. And here, Ooh. let's see what happens. They are so pretty. Aren't they? So now you get a feel for the dark, the light, the midtone. Set this down. What happens to this peachy coral color when I add some black? It's usually a surprise to me. Like I have no idea until I actually swatch it out on here. And I'll call this, this is just a different kind of swatch. Add a little bit more of this gold here. So you've got, you're adding black to the pure color, you're adding black to the tint, which already has white. And as soon as you add black and white, you've got a tone. Now, once you've got that, you can start to play with, well, what if I push this dark a little bluer? Or if I push the light a little more red? Can you see how, <laughs> if, if you did this much with colors that you were not familiar with, like you could even blindly choose one color, two color, three colors, plus black and white, and just throw it onto a sheet of paper that's kind of even a, a, a scrap sheet of paper, you would very quickly, as I've done here, maybe five minutes, right? I'm gonna hold this closer to the camera so you can really see, but can you yeah. see how, do you like that palette? It's like, do you, do you have a feeling of, is it a, like something you wanna pursue? If yes. it is, okay, great. <laughs> That's the only thing you have to ask yourself, do I like it or not? And if the answer is yes, that's a palette worth exploring. The yes. other thing that I would do on here to save it is I would grab a pen or pencil or whatever. Uh, I usually put the medium, cold wax medium and oil. This is Arches oil paper. The colors are indigo, yellow ochre, because I'll tell you, you may remember those colors now. But in a way, you're not going to remember. And that's frustrating. I think. It, it is. 
right? Yes, How so am I. <laughs> yeah, and if you can't remember, it's kind of sad. You're like, it oh, is, because gosh. And so let's see, Pat asked, say the name of the colors again, because I don't think the word she's typing is what they were. Okay, so I've got indigo, which I made myself. Now, some brands will give you indigo, but I mixed my own, which is ultramarine blue plus Payne's gray. And okay. then I used yellow ochre. And then I used quinacridone red. Okay. The quinacridone red that I use is from Gamblin. Uh, the yellow ochre is a Gamblin color, and the blue is also Gamblin, but you know, the brand doesn't really matter. So now let's say you've done this and you're like, um, gosh, can I make this into a painting? Well, I take every opportunity to ask myself that question. I've got a dark over here. And this is where you might, you know, kind of know a little bit about design. It kind of helps you to like, where's my eye going, right? And so if I wanted to make this into a painting, um, expressing things I love, like I love mark making, right? So just tweaking this a little bit, and there's nothing wrong with it just being a swatch at all. I mean, that's that's perfectly great. But if I can make this into a finished painting, then uh, I'm going to do it, right? So now I'm, I'm going back to my palette here, you can see. And I'm Bonnie looking wants to know if you consider which colors are warm or cool to start with. Well, when you start with the, let's say, quote unquote, primary, you've got the warm, you've got warm and cool because primary palettes have the typical bled blue, red, and yellow. You've got two warms and a cool. Um, when you start with complementary colors, like across the color wheel, like green and red, you've got a warm and a cool, or uh, blue and orange, a warm and a cool, or purple and yellow, a warm and a cool. So that's the advantage of using the color wheel and complements is that you automatically get a warm and a cool. And yeah. then like, like, like I've talked about in both Art Success Masters and Powerful Design Personal Color, you kind of want one group, you want the warms or cools to, uh, one of them to win so that there's not a war going on. If you get stuck in your painting, it's often because the colors are struggling. Um, one, there's no real winner. You've got like 50% warm and 50% cool, and that can cause a few visual problems. So like here, I've got white smack dab in the middle. So I'm gonna put a little bit of this um, and maybe just mix it up a bit like that for interest. I'm going into this and saying, where does my eye go first? It goes here, because this is the area of highest contrast. And um, I've just made a few marks here, just with this silicone tool. Um, I've got this color here. So now I might blend it a little bit more, just repeating this beautiful color and maybe picking up a bit of that black line. And whatever happens, I'm prepared to work with it, right? So now I've picked up a bit of that indigo blue. It's coming into this little puddle it's going darker because the indigo blue is so dark. And that's what I kind of would want because I don't want it to be too light. I want it to be mid-tone. So here's a mid-tone. All this is mid-tone except for this, which is really dark. Here's a little bit of dark. Now it's surrounded by white, which is the highest, lightest key you can possibly have. Um, so right now, without doing much of anything, um, I can come in with my pencil and uh, let's see here. Just to add a little bit more interest, I could go with a darker pencil. I even have an art graph I could use. So I'm just showing you that even if you're you know doing this, you're you're doing a swatch, it doesn't have to be boring. You know, it can be really fun. And um, I'm gonna come into this white so it's not quite as um, you know, I have to have my marks. So yes. I'm coming like this. And then, you know, maybe a little bit of rectilinear because I don't have that. And let's see here, get the wax on my pencil here. Um, a little bit more assertive lines here. And then I like pattern, can add a bit of that in there. If I don't like something, like if this got to be a little bit too um, goofy, I can add, let's see here, some white. I've got a whole nother palette over here. I was gonna work on a bigger board, but um, I can just for now work on this. So there I've made this color lighter, it's indigo. 
and I want to make it go in a direction. So I might add a little bit of yellow. Now it's more sophisticated because it's not just that one color anymore. So then, beautiful. Oh, thanks, Lisa. A little bit more red. Very quickly, I've changed the nature of this color. And now I look at it on my palette. I do a lot, I do spend a lot of time just mixing colors. And <clears throat> I need a little bit more white. So I've got white on my other palette because I, I I very quickly go through my white. That's just one thing that happens. So I just and be sure and ask questions if you have questions while Pam is doing this. Thanks, Lisa. So I'll add the white here. And I just want this to go a little lighter. So I'm going to mix that in. I'm just using my silicone tool. And Bonnie mentioned that she was wondering about a cool red versus a warm red and same with blue and yellow. And But then she just answered her own question, <coughs> excuse me, and says, I guess you could just play around with this, which is actually the answer, right? It is, but you know, also when you, when you, you know, the more, I guess the more you know about your colors, the more swatches you've made, et cetera, yes. the more you're gonna know um, which are cool and which are warm, because that's a good point though, that um, just because it's red does not mean it's necessarily gonna be a warm color, it can be a cool red. So yeah. everything's really relative. And um, those are all things that you can discover when you get into the painting part. And so I'm just playing around a little bit. Now, now that I've done this, you know, like this shape, I'm noticing is much like the size of that shape and this shape and this shape. So I might want to expand it out and get maybe a bit of a dry brush edge here. So now I'm getting this as sort of a dry brush. Again, working wet into wet with cold wax and oil, you kind of can go as far as, as you can, but then you're going to hit a stopping point where it's like, okay, now I've got uh, the paint is quite uh, wet. There's only so much I can do, um, but when it is wet, like this, because I've just done it. One of the few things you can get away with is um, mono printing. So I wanted to show a little bit about that. I'm gonna grab a sheet of deli paper off to the side here and just take, like I've got a gray here. So this is a kind of a mid-tone gray RNF pigment stick. Ooh. Really huge, and I love yeah. these. <laughs> um, so That's big. Well, <laughs> yeah, I know. So what I'll do is I'll just put it on the deli paper like that. Now, again, I'm, you can do mono printing at any stage of a cold wax and oil painting, but there are very few things you can do when your paint is this wet. And so that's one of the things that I know artists who work in this medium get a little stuck with because they're like, oh my gosh, I've got a gloppy mess. And the reason is that you need to give it some time to set up before you go into most other techniques like brain, braying. If I were to use a brayer right now on this, I would get um, a mess. And the reason is that this is very, very wet. Whereas if I'd done the brayer first on just the paper, that would have been fine. But the brayering is not good when you've got super wet cold wax and oil. So I do have a chart in my cold wax and oil course. I have a course on this that explains like, when do you use certain techniques? When don't you use them? What do you get? When do you get the best results? So now I'm going to take this gray and again, it's wet. So I don't know exactly how well this is, but I'm using a gentle touch. I'm not pressing really hard, um, but I do love the mono print effect. And again, I don't really know how well this will transfer. I'm going to press a little harder when it's on the white paper and then just lightly lift this. So then I get this lovely, you know, I love um, texture and <clears throat> there is some paint left on the sheet even. Where might, I, where might I want a little bit of that dark blue? So I look around the composition and say, hmm, where can I transfer that color? Maybe up here, right? It's just a little bit, I can press kind of hard and there it is. Um, I've also I've still got some gray on here. I didn't use it all up. So maybe I want to just use part of it. These are all decisions that you can make. Um, now I'm using my fingertips to really mush it in there, but I'm not doing the whole thing, not the whole shape. Now I've got a little echo of that, but it's smaller. 
So size becomes, it's one of our design elements that we can always use to help us. And so I'm just gonna uh, probably keep this just in case. Now the gray also though, I could just um, take again. So I, I put this RNF pigment stick on here. There's still quite a bit of paint on there. If I lay it now going horizontally and I don't press on it, I just lay it down lightly and I take something to draw with, right? Because that's fun. And I lift it up. Now it's just added a whisper of that gray. Uh, very quickly, you can develop these. You know, this began as a swatch, um, a very random swatch, like how do these colors work together? But I would say that if I did this, and I, again, respond emotionally to it and say, wow, you know, I, I really like how these colors are working together. That would then give me the courage to mix a whole lot more paint and go into uh, a, a, an official painting. Like, but there's no reason why your swatch can't become an official painting, right? So anyways, I'll just show you a little close up of this. So any comments about that process of using this kind of method to develop a swatch. Do you like these colors? Uh, test the tints, tones, and shades. One color, two colors, or three colors plus black and white. There's no reason why you can't add the other things you love, like mark making, and maybe there's a special shape you like. Now, when this sets up too, I could easily come in with my masking and you know all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I could just do this all day. So anyways, that's that one. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, Leslie wanted to know how you do this for encaustic. Well, yeah, okay. So similar thing you might have, as far as your substrate goes, it could be an encaustic board. It could be a sheet of uh, illustration board. You know, your substrate obviously has to be able to you be able to heat it. Um, same thing. I mean, you know, you've got a hot palette and what you see over here could be done on a hot palette. And that's exactly what I would do. Okay. I would have my, my encaustic board and I would mix up all of these values here and, and combinations and do a swatch here and do a little bit of paint there and add my mark making. It would look pretty close to this. So again, <laughs> don't, let, don't let the medium stop you guys from, you know, exploring all these things that you really, the color, uh, being able to understand color in all of these different media uh, require that you do test out these colors and how they combine. Any other questions? Um, let's see, we have a couple questions, but not necessarily about this. Do you wanna answer those or wait till the end? Um, you can, sure, they can, you can ask them now while it's fresh. Okay, great. Um, Amy wondered about pouring the acrylics into squeeze bottles. She does not do so well with that. Do you use a funnel or anything to get those from the big containers to the squeeze bottles? <laughs> you know, I just asked me that the other day. Yes, I do use a funnel. So a funnel is, you know, like it's great. It works great. Ah, okay. There you go. A funnel. Okay. <laughs> and then um, so, let's see here. Pat is asking about a fourth color and I don't know how to pronounce it. Asphaltum. Asphaltum, yeah. Right. So what's the question? Um, what is that fourth color? I think is what that was. Oh, asphaltum. Yes, asphaltum. Um, A S P H A L T U M. I believe that's made by Gamblin. And I'm not sure that comes in a pig RNF pigment stick. I don't really think that one does. Somebody out there, if you know, you can correct me on that. But um what color is that? I mean, is it oh. I've never it's heard of it. Like a dark brown. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, and then um, let's see. There are people are mentioning how they are loving what you're doing, though. Pam, sorry about that. Just yeah. had those questions I had to find before they were gone. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So the next step. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate that. Now, guys, um, so encaustic board is one of my favorite surfaces for so many different things. Obviously encaustic, because it does say the word encaustic. And these boards are made by ampersand and uh, they come in all different sizes and they've got so many different types of surfaces, uh, even scratch board, they've got boards for water media, they're called aqua boards, they've got 
uh, boards for pastel. Encaustic board is good for encaustic and oil and cold wax and acrylic gouache. So I like this board because it can be used for so many different things. And it comes wrapped in plastic. And I'm just gonna uh, cut through here. And it's all, it's got this beautiful composite board here. And it has a beautifully gessoed, it's pre-gessoed, so you don't have to put any gesso over the top. And it is RNF gesso. So they have uh, gotten together with RNF paints and they've gessoed the surface already for you. There is no more, like to me, this is like the ultimate beautiful surface. And what I want to show you then is I'm going to like kind of move this palette out of the way. But first I want to just transfer any paint that's on here and kind of reuse it. So this is my indigo blue. And I'm going to show you this in a second that I have another palette. When you, when you decide that when you commit to a palette and you're like, okay, I really want to use this palette now. Okay. Um, then you're going to need more space. That's the first thing. And I'm not even scaling up much from that little sample piece that I showed you, but this is 12 by 12. And I'm going to move my mixed up again. This is sorry. I'm just going to do this so that I can make the most of my paint. So that's pretty good. So I'm going to use the same palette knives and, and to clean. Some people have asked me, how do you clean your tools? If you're working with oil and cold wax medium, all you really need is cooking oil. Okay. Cheapest yeah. cooking oil you can find. No, you don't need extra light olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, anything like that. Don't go doing that. You just need regular oil. I'm going to move these knives over. Do you know if uh, the encaustic boards, um, if they ship to other countries like Iceland? Boy, I think that they might, but I, I'm not really sure. They are a family owned company and they they are in Buda, Texas. Uh, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. But they can probably call or email them easily yeah. because they are very responsive. Yeah, they really are. So thanks for the question and I definitely would check with them. They, they have these mini boards that I absolutely love. They're like trading cards and I just did a demo with my encaustic showing how I explored harmony. <laughs> so that's going to be my painting with fire 2023 um, videos. The, um, the person asking about the putting in squirt bottles, do you use the Nova in the squirt bottles? Do you add any medium to it? Um, and you don't use the heavy body in squirt bottles, thinning it down. You just use the, um, fluid Nova. and all that, right? Correct. Yes. So I use Nova colors, um, almost exclusively. I don't really get into the heavy body acrylics. Um, you know, I, I could, I have some fluids, but I, again, I just don't do a whole lot of that. And so what I want to show you guys here is my setup. This is a bigger palette. So right off the bat, this is my little test palette, right? Now I've gotten almost all the paint off of here. And, uh, you know, because I'm a person who doesn't like to waste paint, um, why not? This, this is going to be a painting. <laughs> um, there's no reason why you can't have fun. Um, in fact, that's how I start all of my paintings with fun. Oh, oh that's great. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> um, okay. So what I want to show you guys, I have mixed in my cold wax medium with this paint. And I put a little dollop of cold wax medium next to any paint. The minute I squirt out a, a fresh oil paint, I put a little dollop of cold wax medium so I don't forget. Because once it's like once it's mixed in, you can't really tell too easily if you've mixed it in or not. And that can be a problem. Like, did I add it or not? So I just put that little dollop there to remind me that, hey, you better mix it in. Now that I've mixed it in, I don't have to worry. This is my indigo. What happens is the one way you can kind of tell is that it gets more stiff, um, more like frosting. It's not as oily. That's one way you can kind of tell. But aside from that, if you don't remember, if you added it, it's kind of a guessing game. So notice I've got the same colors that I just did that little practice piece with. This is my yellow ochre. And now what I might do is I've put some of this paint on here as you can see. And 
this, what I want to show you now is number one, I'm working with a limited palette, but number two, I am going to play. I have no idea where this is going. I, but I know enough about color and design um, that I know I will be able to finish it. What it will look like, I have not a clue and I don't care. Um, but it's kind of nice to know that no matter, the reason why I can play so freely is because I know that no matter what happens, I can shift things around, I can assert and obliterate, I can do anything I want and just have fun in the stage. And that's what I, I hope a lot of you out there are doing is having fun. Now, this being a beautiful gessoed board surface, um, I could start with, you know, like a contour drawing on here and just Susan likes it just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It, what happens if that happens? Sometimes I will. Yeah. We can certainly save it. Um, I'm, I'm just looking around my table here and drawing things that are sitting here. I'm doing blind contour drawing, which we, we covered in, I think it was episode one, you know, where you're just kind of doing drawings. And again, I love, I love lines. So whether you're doing it, looking at something or not, it doesn't really matter. Just, you know, have fun. What's fun to you? Imagine that you're three. That's really a great thing to do. A um, couple of scribbles. What else can I do on a fresh board like this? Well, I can take, again, these brayers can be fun to play with. And I'm going to take one of the brighter colors because, um, and that would be this clinacridone red. I'm going to charge my brayer, taking it. Here's the brayer. It's clean now. And you charge it by just lightly going like this going back and forth, back and forth until you get a pretty even coating on your brayer. Okay, so and it also looks really kind of tacky. You can see that. And you just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Now you can play with this in terms of like, do I want to just go straight like that? But I've told you guys before that I don't really like how um, a brayer necessarily looks like it's this width and it's going to be like a rectangular thing there's nothing wrong with that but what if and i'm always asking myself like what if even in the play stage i just did something like this so i kind of disguise the fact that i've used a brayer right and i i love to use masks and things like that so here you can see how bright this red is um this is all by itself here this is the pure color and now I've got this interesting edge that's been applied with the brayer, but you wouldn't know that, right? And for me, that's a good thing. I don't really want people to say, oh, use a brayer. Um, I like to disguise my tools because it's just more fun that way. You know, there wasn't much left on there. And uh, now I've got some paint on here. What can I do with a brayer? Just, just out of curiosity, like if I was three, what would I be doing with a brayer? <laughs> that's right. Be a three-year-old. Yeah. Right. So look, I can get a very light passage on here. And uh, and I can also kind of disguise that brayer mark just by going over it like this. So I'm kind of just showing you some ways that you could start playing with a brayer if you wanted to. I can put the this thing. Giovanna mentioned that you could just put a dot on it and make a dotted line. <laughs> Yay, there you go. That's a great idea. Now here I put in a rectilinear shape um, for the most part here, you can see, but where that diverges is this, this torn edge. Um, you can keep playing with things like this. And now let's see, how about if I add a color change? So I'm going to add now a little bit of this gold into the red. Remember that swatch I did was exploring all the many color combinations and from that, you make these mental notes like, oh, yeah, I remember how much I loved quinacridone red plus yellow ochre. Now, this is a lot deeper than that. I can put a glob of it here like this, right? I can make a bit of a pattern just like that. Uh, then I could take, could take a brayer and just lightly, like you can see how I'm not even holding on to this brayer. <laughs> I'm going to just brayer over it very lightly, pick up the pattern and, you know, repetition with variation is a, is a pretty important unifier in a painting. I can, um, I can go around this whole board and just repeat that pattern. It, it's not, it's going to get lighter and lighter. So I can charge it up again, change the angle. 
So you can kind of play with your brayer that way. And, but what I really wanted to do here was um, take that gorgeous color, which was this. It's, it's um, hard to even describe what this is. It's, it's quite lovely, but um, what you'll notice about this ampersand panel and caustic board is you put it on uh, and this relates to kind of the assert and obliterate thing. Um, you put it on, now I've obliterated the lines underneath it, right? I could leave it that thick, but I can also reveal. So there's conceal and reveal. It has stained that gesso. I can see through it. So you can see how transparent it is when you actually lift that color. Oh, it's yeah. Line. yeah. So once you know that, you know, you can basically, any, any place I've got line or anything like that, I, I know that it's quite lovely and it's quite transparent. Now it does have quinacridone red in it, which is a transparent color. It says that right on the tube. That's another thing about your tube colors or whether they are acrylic or cold wax medium, they will often tell you whether they're transparent, opaque, semi-transparent, semi-opaque. Um, and that's, that's more for professional grade colors. You're not gonna get that so much with student grade. So now let's say I wanna do that up here, but I want it to go lighter. So I can actually mix right on my board. I don't have to mix on the palette and see what happens. You can use your board like a palette and leave the paint super thick like that if you want to. And let's say that I'm like, okay, I'm okay with this color. It's like a skin color. <laughs> but what if I wanted to go more, I don't know, add a little bit of red to this, right? So I want it to be lighter in value, but I want it to go a little bit with a little bit more color. So again, using my entire painting surface as a mixing area. And I often love to have thick and thin paint. So right now it is thicker and I have to, you know, I don't have to mix it really, really well. I, I can leave it streaky if I want to, but maybe I'll come up here and get rid of some of that white gesso. One of the things I try to do kind of early on is um, cover up a lot of this white gesso because I, I like to add my whites to a surface. I don't necessarily like to leave, say, bare paper behind or a gessoed surface behind. I can, and I've done it. It's just that the surface quality is not going to be the same. Okay. Any questions so far? Just cold wax medium is, is a different, you know, medium than some of you have tried. Um, maybe it'd be nice to know if you guys work in cold wax and oil. <laughs> Um, there are a couple people who have said they do. Amy does. And Amy, I think, was trying to put tube paint in the squirt bottles. But that's just not going to be near as easy um, as buying um, the fluid golden because it will already transfer easily. Well, the fluids come, I think they come in a bottle already. That's the first thing, right? Right. And, and unless you buy the gallon size, then you're going to need to transfer it to okay. the squirts. But yeah. And then the Nova colors, they come in the little pot, right? But they they go pretty easily into a squirt bottle, don't they? Well, Nova colors come in um, a variety of sizes, 4 ounce, 8 ounce, 16 ounce, uh, I believe. And and they come in jars with lids. And that those are the ones, because of their fluidity, I like to transfer those on into bottles and I use a funnel. What I don't like are the buckets. And if I get a gallon, they come in buckets, but they mm -hmm. also offer you to put, to send them to you in a gallon jug. Now they don't always have that. They'll say like one time I ordered a gallon of something and it's like, well, I want the jug. And then they got back to me and they're like, sorry, we, we don't have the jug. Do you want the bucket? And it's like, okay, I'll take the bucket. But I mean, I just don't like the bucket as much. Um, because it, you've got a lid on it and it's hard to pour. Um, so that's why I will transfer that into a gallon plastic jug. And you just order those on Amazon or wherever you can get them. You know, they're, they're not that hard to find. Do yeah. you thin Nova colors with anything or do you just use it straight from the squirt bottle then after you've poured it from the bucket? 
So when I transfer it to squirt bottles, it's as, as is. I don't add anything to it. The only time I would add any medium to it is when I'm in the painting process itself. Okay. I might add air, airbrush medium or I might add a, um, a gel medium, you know, um, that's fine. But as far as when I transfer from the container they've given me is as how it came. I don't, I don't uh, manipulate it at all um, until I'm ready to paint with it. Great. That answers that totally. Thank you, Pam. That sure. should be helpful to Amy. Um, that way she'll know what she needs. Yeah. I don't, I don't ever try to put the heavy body paint in. I just use it as it is myself, but I'm, I'm like you, I like the thinner <laughs> myself. So, and then we have lots of people saying, yes, they do cold wax and oil and okay. that no, but they wanted to, they've been intimidated. Oh. Um, and Diana, she uses it over acrylic on board. And let's see here. Ursula was asking Diana, what is the benefit of using it together over acrylic? Okay. And do you ever do that? Yeah, I do. Um, and I've got videos on that. Um, I found early on that <clears throat> um, because acrylic dries a lot faster, and I'm just doing a quick monoprint here, guys. Um, it, because acrylic dries a lot faster, you can have an underpainting of acrylic. And then once you get it to a certain, you know, you're done playing or whatever, and you're ready to, to transition into oil and cold wax medium, um, that, that will then dry slower and it'll give you more time to, you know, uh, do those finesses of surface quality that like, I particularly love that about cold wax and oil. So you have to have a reason for doing it, but you just put Liquitex clear gesso over your acrylic, dried acrylic painting. And, and now you can absolutely go over that with oil and cold wax, but that would be the last, so you don't go back into acrylic after that, you stay then with oil and cold wax medium. Right. Marie says that watching you play so freely makes her really want to work in cold wax and oils again. <laughs> fun. That's fun. I hope you guys yeah. are. Yeah. Seeing how um, I am not thinking I'm going to be playing for quite some time. And as this paint gets, you know, wetter and wetter, uh, what I'm doing is basically kind of what I did on my slot board or not my slot board, but my little, you know, color swatch slash painting, right? It, it kind of became a bit of a painting, but it would need a little bit more work. But on the other hand, I kind of like how spontaneous it was, it was done in the moment. And sometimes I'll just keep a painting like that, you know, like, hey, this is done to explore a color palette. And it was done like it, it's a 60 minute painting or whatever. It's like, you can hang on to those just because they represent uh, maybe a limitation of time could do a, a number of 60 minute paintings and just keep them. A lot of times that might be some of your happiest work. There's no reason why you can't keep that. Time limits are good sometimes. Yeah. So I'm what I'm exploring, like as this evolves and, and, and basically becomes a painting before my eyes, I'm noticing the contrast between thick and opaque versus thin and transparent. Um, I'm noticing where I've got lines that show through the transparent paint and then where they disappear behind the opaque paint over here. Like I, I kind of like this corner. Uh, well, I, I'm not gonna say I really like it. What I mean to say is that I, I'm curious uh, what would happen if, so that's another thing, even in the play stage, I'll be like, well, what if I do this? and so what I'm going to do is take plain cold wax medium, which I have in this little container that's labeled. Always good to label things. And I'll just take a little bit of this here with a clean tool. Um, now you can do this, even though the paint already does have some cold wax medium in it. It's okay. Like, because I'm on a hard surface, when you guys work in cold wax and oil, it's perfectly fine to vary that uh, proportion that you have with your paints, whether it's a glaze, which will have more cold wax medium in it. So notice how just by adding more cold wax medium, 
the nature of this corner down here used to be rather dry brush, but now it's it's becoming more like you know paint that's been blended. It's not so quite so thin anymore. It's actually got a little bit more personality, a little bit more saturation compared to what was over here when it was done so thinly. And that was the purpose of that. But you you can come in then and man manipulate your paints just with this cold wax medium. It's still a glaze. Pam, was that cold wax medium plain or did that have something in it? Everything in this container, and I've labeled it right. So it's one to three G gel. Very ah. important to label. Uh, I that that is actually like the way that I work. Um, I'm almost always using that. Now I can come into this corner now and say, okay, well, I've just added some cold wax medium to it and it's okay, but maybe I want something a little different. So you can see right now this painting is leaning toward the warms. And I have to say, do I, do I react to this emotionally? Like I'm still playing and everything, but I could shift this to the cools, but right now I'm kind of just enjoying the palette. And because for whatever reason, it's, it's starting to be more predominantly warm. Um, that's just an observation, even in play. I'm just observing and I'm just observing how I feel about it, even in play, because play can quickly um, give you something that you're really, really happy with. You need to be prepared for that. And I think if you really love it, then stop, you know, just let it dry and stop. Now, this is interesting how I'm putting another color over this uh, coral color, uh, bringing out down to the edge on the bottom. And I don't know, I don't know uh, what's gonna happen when I do this with this silicone tool, because I don't know how, how much this paint has soaked into the gesso, like that gesso is thirsty and it's holding on to the paint. So I'm not gonna lift much of it. That's what I just discovered by going over it. It's not coming off. You can tell that because I, you know, I'm going over it like this. See how it's not coming off? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. That's good to know. Like, well, does this come off? Does does this come off? Um, so again, you, it, it's a question of like um, conceal and reveal. So what I know about this then, as I play with this paint, is I can probably take um, I take a skewer, I take the, the broad end of a skewer and draw into this even additional lines because, and that can stay or not, you know, doesn't really matter. I can come over here. Now this, these marks here will probably um, smudge. So because they're wet, if I, I'm going to put this down here. Now you can work directly into this with RNF pigment sticks as well. So let me see here. I've got gray, white. I, I've matched the palette. So I've got quinacridone red here. And um, it's playing. That's a very bright color. And then I can come in with indigo, get darker. <clears throat> like this. I like how juicy that is, but I'm just gonna lightly go over this. See, it's very light on the paper. Maybe I want it up here, going in a different direction. Now this is wet over wet. Again, not a whole lot I can do when the paint is this wet and especially, yeah, it didn't show up very well, but that's okay. What I could do is <clears throat> draw directly on here. And you almost have to do that if you want to um, transfer wet into wet, you, you know, to, it's expecting a lot of the paint here 
to, to be able to do that when, and I don't really want the whole mark. I really want to kind of just have to figure out where I do want this, if at all. Um, and I can always cover it up, so I'll just go like this. Not thinking, just plain. So I believe that in play, that's where the magic happens. Um, it's really, really important to allow yourself to just let go and imagine that nothing matters. Um, you're not thinking about the end product ever during play. That is so far from your mind. Because if you start thinking about that and, and all the reasons why you need to finish it during a certain period of time, it's going to shut you down. All right. Um, Pam, I can't remember. Do you list your colors and uh, things that you're using under the video for each video? Um, not for these lives. I mean, basically, I, I talk about them during the video. And because I don't, you know, it's it's not about what did Pam do. It's what, what do you want to do? I, I sort of want you guys to explore um, on your own. And you know, I'm certainly happy to tell you what colors if you need me to. But um, yeah, I, I really want you guys just to have fun and explore. And I do uh, list all of my favorite, like, boards and paints and supplies, equipment, all that kind of stuff on my resource page. Oh, so, yes. Know. I can put that link. Yeah. That's kind of like always there. And I, I actually use that myself when I need to reorder something. I just link over to wherever I get stuff from. So now I'm using the brayer just to kind of move things around and add a little bit of geometry. That's one thing a brayer is good for is adding geometry because it does have that very identifiable mark. but kind of a light touch. So now I've obliterated some of that red that I started with because it was a little intense. I didn't want it to be quite that intense. And then I can come in and brayer in another color, like grab some of that other color and mix it here. I'm still watching the value. Take some of that red. Take a bit more. So you can kind of see how, um, even though I started uh, this little upper corner here with um, the mask and everything, that's pretty much gone. And I can come in here now. It's it's amazing. You can't see what I see, but uh, by going over a certain area that it's wet. But if I come in with a brayer over it, now the value is the same, the color is the same, everything. But but going over a little section with a brayer, uh, if you could see this close up there is a different surface quality it's it's much more solid of a color and these little solid areas um, really give your eye like a resting place so that's just an observation um sarah mentioned that she's surprised how much she likes the soft colors mm -hmm. cool yeah like i have not used this palette before so for me it's all new I like to say that I am a beginner because every time I paint, I'm beginning something new that I've never done before. And if I'm not doing something new that I've never done before, then I'm usually just not as happy. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Yep. Got to be messing around, trying new stuff. Yeah. See, now I'm doing this. I get bored, right? Yeah. Let's see, I'm hunting for the resource link. Okay, I keep forgetting what I'm doing <clears throat> answering questions. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's just artandsuccess.com slash resources. It's pretty oh, easy. For there you, you go. Um, yeah, now I don't have a lot of blue in here, so that might be the next place that I go and start to add some blue <coughs> into this mixture here. I'm use my brayer to get things going a little bit and and even though you don't haven't used this palette you do use um the sophisticated complex colors all the time i would say that i'm always 
uh, for the most part, looking at mixtures rather than the, the solid color. This was a solid color, but notice how quickly I covered it up because I quickly felt like, wow, that's really intense. Um, so, and a little bit of this color here. This is my cool. And because it's so, it's the anomaly now in this painting, it's, there aren't many areas where it's cool. I'm kind of watching the size of the shape. What's the shape doing, even in play? Let's see, and somebody asked about the black juicy mark, and that was the um, marabou, right? I think that might have been the marabou here. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to show you that, let's see here. Yeah, that's a nice juicy mark, and you can you can definitely work that into your cold wax and oil. And now I've got white. I've got this gray again. So now most of my, um, well, the monoprint was actually in the other painting. So let me just try a little bit more of that. Do you often, sometimes, or never paint with oil and cold wax on canvas? Well, if you're going to paint on canvas, there's a little bit of a, a rule that is, you know, I say rule because it has to do with, like, the stability of your paint. So if you're going to work on canvas, keep the amount of cold wax medium either with or without Galka gel to less than 25%. As long as it's less than 25%, you shouldn't have any problems with, you know, it. like the stability of it should be fine. And I don't then, work on canvas. Um, I haven't yet, but I, I do hope to do that. It's just that I know that when I start doing that, I better make sure that I'm not working with more than 25% oil. And at this point I'm working with half and half. So that's uh, definitely more than you'd wanna use if you're transitioning over to canvas. And then um, Ursula asked, and I think that um, I'm, you've probably mentioned this before because color is in all mediums the same for the most part, she was asking if it changed with the cold wax medium, how the colors appear. Uh, well, just like in any medium, I mean, you could say that uh, yellow ochre is an opaque, right? But I can make it more transparent by adding cold wax medium to it. That's I can also make it more transparent by adding acrylic medium to it. So um, opacity, opaque colors can be made thinner and transparent colors can they're going to be transparent unless you mix them with an opaque color um, for the most part. There you go. So there are some differences you can make happen. Yeah. Which is kind of nice. Yeah. So where are we at time-wise? Okay. Well, well we're after the guys. Yep. We're a little after. Yeah. So I think that, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please, uh, you know, be sure to like the videos if you like these episodes. That's what keeps us coming um, because we, we need your feedback. Please subscribe to the channel and, you know, share these episodes with your friends. Tell them to come join us on Momentum Mondays because we're always doing something different. Hopefully uh, topics that you're interested in. And in the comment section below, let us know if there's a topic you really like, really want us to do something about. And uh, Lisa and I will do our hardest uh, do our hardest to get uh, that topic into one of our episodes yeah okay thanks everybody we really appreciate you being here and hope yes. you have a wonderful week after our momentum monday yes bye everybody bye